Hi, I'm Jennifer, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. Have you ever thought of experiencing Japan as a student? Today, we'll be discussing how and why you should study abroad in Japan. Studying abroad can be a unique way to experience Japan. There will be aspects that you'll be able to experience as a student that an average visitor will not get to see. In this episode, we'll help you discover some study abroad options and what you'll need to consider when thinking about studying abroad. We'll even share our own study abroad experiences in Japan. That way, you'll get a better grasp of studying abroad. Hopefully, after this episode, you'll want to go on your own study abroad journey in Japan. Today, I am with Nigel and Doug. Say hey, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that actually, too, but what's up? Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, one of the things that all three of us have in common is that we all studied abroad in Japan during college. That we did. Yeah, and you you and I, Jen, we went on the same program. Yeah, yeah, we went on the same program. And Doug, Not the same went... year, but the yes. same kind of program. <laughs> yes, yes, same same program in name but different year and doug yeah. you went on an entirely different program yeah i, I did a uh, program through loyola uh directly yeah. with a exchange program in tokyo yeah so one of the things that probably a lot of people don't really maybe not understand is what study abroad actually is mm -hmm. um who would like to enlighten our listeners on what study abroad is from our definition isn't it your job to enlighten people yeah, what I was gonna study say, abroad I think... is. <laughs> Why don't you do it, Jen? But I do it every day. <laughs> yeah, you might be tired of it. Well, well, like I feel like if we define it, you know, it might be like some type of mangled up definition. No, where you but probably it's have interesting. A it's interesting to see how previous students who have studied abroad could define it because I work for it. So students are like, "Oh, well, that's you work for study abroad, so obviously you want us to study abroad," but. To hear it from past students is a totally different thing. So that's why I'm kind of interested in what y'all's definition of study abroad is. Okay. okay. If I had to think of something on the spot, I would probably say studying abroad is um, spending a specific amount of time. I hate to say studying, but uh, spending a certain amount of time uh, immersed in a culture that is not your own. Uh, taking classes and I don't know learning um, learning the culture but but really it's like study abroad is part of it is the like the, the book part but I feel like the other part of studying is being immersed in the culture and and you know being in a place so when I say study abroad I I think of both of those things you know studying abroad in another university but also in a different culture if that makes sense yeah it does good nice doug what? you stole my answer, <laughs> that was uh, your answer? a lot of that going around <laughs> <laughs> no um I, I would say you know study abroad is really it, it is an experience it's not just going to classes or anything like that it is much more than that it's immersing yourself as nigel said in a culture and taking yourself out of your own comfort zone and experiencing an educational setting that's that maybe you're not familiar with um, in a country you're not familiar with a lot of times. Um, so, you know, it is a mixture of education. That's I mean, that's the primary focus of you going over there. But a lot of times when you talk to it, it's a lot of time is more just forming bonds with people in that country, whether it's actually Japanese people or other kids or people from other countries who have also come to study abroad I think that's one thing people forget about when doing these types of programs is yeah. that it's not just to go over there and meet Japanese people, but it's also you meet people from everywhere that are doing the same thing as you. And it really kind of opens your eyes, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a personal growth experience yeah. that, um, you know, can really change people for, for the better, in my opinion. And I was going to say, you know, if I actually could sum it up and maybe a cleaner definition, that's maybe a little bit more, um, 
I don't know, metaphorical or, or something like that. But I would say a life, it's a life changing experience. Now, even if it's a bad experience, it's still life changing. <laughs> but hopefully, no, it's a good experience. But I mean, everyone that I've known that has done or, you know, undertaken a study abroad experience, it has absolutely changed their lives. Yeah. Good. So how would you define it, Jen? Yeah, so like we have like this PowerPoint that we show students all the time in classes when we go present. And, you know, a lot of the qualities that we talk about for study abroad, you've kind of already touched upon. So, yeah, it is that academic and travel based program because you are getting best of both worlds. You know, you're going abroad, experiencing the culture, the people, the lifestyle, because you are living there for an extended amount of time. You're, you know, deeply immersed into the lifestyle and culture, but you're also taking class credit. You're getting credit that you would have had to get at your university in order to graduate with your degree. So you're doing two things at once, and it's a really great way to do those two things. And just to the class credit thing, I know we're probably going to touch on this at some point. Yeah. But a lot of times in, in your home country, wherever you're based out of, you're, you're getting graded A, B, C, whatever, you know, your ranges. On study abroad, at least for the program I was on, it was pass-fail. So an A equal to C, basically. So you don't have to go as hardcore as you maybe normally would. You can actually, because they understand that students who are studying abroad are there to study, but they're also there to also enjoy being in that country. And they don't want to, they want you to learn, but they also don't want you to like kind of like, hunker down in your dorm room to study for six hours a day you know on all or work on research papers for weeks on time you know obviously people there are programs that will require that but not all programs are um as i guess require requirement heavy in in the uh in the grades area wow that was horrible i don't know requirement heavy in the grades area that, <laughs> that's so intelligent right there okay sorry yeah, no, I mean, you're you're right. I mean, it really does depend on the program. Um, and we'll discuss like all the different types of programs because that will come into play depending on like what program you do. If you're going with a program directly with your university, the grades are going to matter. <laughs> um, it'll go on your transcript. Um, but of course, if you go on other kind of programs, which we'll talk about, um, then yeah, it won't admit, it'll still matter, but um, they might not be as uh, strict about it as other programs. But yeah, so um, you have that two, two thing thing going on over there on um, the travel and the um, academic portion. Um, like Nigel said, it is a life changing experience. You know, a lot of students go through maturity and um, independence while studying abroad. They get those skills. Um, and then not only that, but it actually deepens your college experience and it really does advance your academic career, I find. Um, you know, when I went to my university, you know, as a freshman, um, I didn't really feel attached to it. I was just like, oh, I'm coming here because it, I can afford it. My family can afford it. And I, I really don't want to be here, honestly. <laughs> um, I don't like anything about it. Uh, but, you know, studying abroad really helped me appreciate my university. Um, so, you know, things like that, especially if it's something that your university has for an opportunity for their students, um, it's really something to look forward to. And it really does um, deepen your academic career and your college experience. Um, but that's pretty much what we say um, during our presentations of what study abroad is and what it can kind of offer students. And then we kind of pose the question, why not study abroad? Because um, all you, these amazing things happen. Uh, but yeah, so that's just like a little snippet of like what study abroad is to each of us. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you, there's one more thing that we didn't really say, um, but it's, it's study abroad is also a goal. Um, it's something that you can start college in and know that you want to do this and work towards it. So it kind of gives you something that you're working towards early in your freshman year, early. So you can kind of plan out your curriculum and what you want to do. Like I, I knew I wanted to study abroad. I didn't know if it was going to be a semester. I didn't know if it was going to be a summer, a year, but like I kind of planned all of my my course load and everything like taking I took a summer class every year leading up so that way I knew by my third year of college whether it was going to be a full year or a semester I could have a lighter load while I was abroad so it's kind of one of those things you can use it as a planning tool for your university curriculum path 
um, to, to kind of help map where you want to be during that time period while you're in school? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I didn't even think about it like that. When, when Jin, when you asked us, how do you define it? But that was so true for me. When I got to university, I knew that I was, I was going to study abroad. I didn't know how I was going to do it, when I was going to do it, how long, but it was a goal that I had from day one as well. And, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, it also can be that, that chance to finally leave the country for the first time in kind of a safe and structured way, which is not just you traveling without a plan, without having resources and people to, to you know, help you. So it's, it's also that, you know, it's, it's a, it's like a, I don't know, a, a good first step into becoming like a global citizen, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. Um, you know, and we're going to discuss that right now, actually. Um, there are many ways for someone um, to study abroad in Japan as a student. Um, and we're going to go over each one. So the first one actually is kind of what Doug did, which is pretty common, actually, um, which is you go on exchange, whether that's a semester or a year, um, via your university or college. Um, a lot of universities actually offer this. Um, so if your university or college has a international center or some kind of international building department where you can talk to someone about going on exchange, um, then you should definitely discuss this with someone. Um, usually you do have to plan ahead for something like this, um, as Doug said, um, but it's a good experience to have, um, especially if, like Nigel said, you want to go abroad and you know you want to go abroad. Um, this is a good test to see what the future lies for you. You know, go as a student when it's probably the most inexpensive way to travel. <laughs> I know from personal experience, I'm sure these guys do too. Uh, it's much cheaper to go to Japan as a student than as a tourist, um, in my personal opinion, um, and professional opinion as well. Um, another way to go is the short-term study abroad, which is what Nigel and I did through our university. Um, our university had a very short summer study abroad program. Um, it was a study abroad program that the university had a partnership with um, Doshisha University, which is a uh, Japanese university in Kyoto. And uh, we went on that one. Um, but there's also another short-term program um it's called faculty led or department led you would be surprised how many universities actually have this as an option um this is when a faculty member from the university has a class one specific class that they love to teach and they teach it abroad and so it's that faculty member that is in charge of the study abroad um, program. Um, you know, the university itself comes and, you know, arranges everything for that faculty member, but that faculty member is the one in charge and running the show. Um, so those two are your typical short term study abroad. And then you have the last one, which is, um, and y'all, I don't know if y'all have heard of this, but it's um, called third party study abroad or exchange experience. So, um, What's a popular one? I think it's Rotary C Club. Rotary Club is one. Yeah. Um, CIE is one. Um, so I IIE is also. How long do how long do these last? IIE is another one. Um, the third party programs usually last a semester or a year. Um, okay. They kind of so I was going to say not the like not the Japan Society of New Orleans no 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 exchange no. that we no, do no, no, the no. this but, third okay. party study abroad it's exactly like normal study abroad but it's done through a third party company and this is used for students who are at a university or college that do not offer study abroad at all um, so for example. At my college that I work for, my university, we don't offer any programming in South Korea. Say I have a student who really wants to go to South Korea. They have to take it upon themselves to search up a third party 
a study abroad program and go on the program that way. Um, it has nothing to do with the university. Uh, cr course credit is very up in the air um, if it's actually going to count, but at least it's a study abroad experience. Um, so that is one way to do it. And some colleges actually team up with a bunch of third party companies to deliver programming like that so those are just the typical ways of studying abroad yeah i want to say like when i was applying um sophia was definitely an option and then my primary option that i wanted to do but there were other others and i think iae was one of those that was available i think it's been a while yeah iae um, has a lot of programming yeah and they work with a ton of colleges and and one the one good thing about those too is that like you said they work with a ton of colleges so you may be on a program with a bunch of other people who are from all over the country or even world like they're on the same program as you so you and i think you have like orientations and stuff like that i don't like with covid and everything no one knows what how things are being i don't know how things are being handled with that but um you know you would meet a lot of people from around the your own country and you know just before like during pre-departure orientations and things like that too so it's kind of neat because as opposed to being just like a, you know, if you go through your own program at your local university, you're going to be meeting people and going with people from where you're from. But not that way, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Oh, okay. Not really? Yeah, necessarily. I was, I was, that's what I was so going to say. I'm I really can go saying. into depth on this, but yeah, okay. for okay. So if it's your short term study abroad, if it's faculty led, it's most likely less. Yes, going to be from your university. If it's a program that the university holds its own, it could most likely be open to the public. Um, you really have to just determine what program it is. So like the program that I work, the UNO Japan program, University of New Orleans, um, it's open to all students nationwide. So we have students from Arizona, Indiana, oh, okay. Ohio. I can go on and on about the list. Um, but there are some universities i've done research because i like to see like what's out there there are some universities that will say oh so we allow other students to come but you have to pay x amount more and you know that's that's reasonable i guess it's like um, an administration fee or something like that to yeah manage yeah. the project for them eh. It's, it, it's, it's weird. I mean, it just depends. Yeah. Um, our fee is just like a, um, a transcript fee, but at other universities, I've seen it like extend to an extreme amount and I, I question why, but, um, and then, like I said, of course, some universities do keep it at, only at their own. Um, so it really just depends, but yeah, um, for short term, it's most likely going to be open to the public um to other students whereas if it's like an exchange program with your university then yes it's going to be limited to your university um it won't be offered to like other students so that's how it goes yeah i i i think um you know it's i didn't know that i i thought that um the uno program was specifically for just uno students so that's kind of cool yeah that's the beauty of it it's yeah. uh for every it's for all students all university students and another thing that's unique about it which other programs from other universities do that i don't like which is um major distinguishing so like this program in japan it's only for art majors or this program in japan is only for um literature majors and i'm i don't like that it's so limiting uh whereas our program you know you're an engineer majoring major you know come on the program if you're a science major come on the program <laughs> you know everyone come on down um so yeah a lot of the faculty led department led are those kind of programs where it's very you know this specific major is only allowed um so i mean it happens but um you know it works for that college or university so that's how it rolls but some of the things that I do want to talk about with y'all, um, you know, and that's what needs to be considered when thinking about study abroad. Um, you know, it sounds very nice and fluffy and we all, all three of us, uh, we've had private conversations. We get super excited when we talk about our time studying abroad in Japan. But 
there were some things that, you know, we had to really consider when studying abroad, I'm sure. Right, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> um, it wasn't like a... It wasn't like a carefree kind of thing. I mean, yeah, it was nice while we were doing it, but there was a lot of prep work, yeah. a lot of, you know, thinking about, right? Yeah. 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 And, and I think there's a there's a degree to which you can prepare. Um, and then there's it, it reaches a limit, you know, to the point where, yeah. you know, the rest of it is out of your hands and you just have to get there and experience it. But I would say the biggest thing you have to consider is if this is your first time traveling somewhere is culture shock. I mean, yep. I think right out of, out of the gate, you know, that has to be the one thing that you plan for, but it's hard because you can't quite plan for it because you don't necessarily know how you will experience the culture shock of being somewhere. And if, especially if you go to some place like Japan and let's say you're from the U S the the difference in culture can be you know pretty uh i don't know pretty jolting and it's not like you know oh you're not gonna be able to get around everything's in japanese nothing's in, like you'll see english you know thing it'll it'll be pretty easy to navigate once you put your navigator's hat on but i don't know for me i i've been you know waiting to go to japan since i was literally a child and still getting there you know it was like i, I just couldn't believe it you know, and there were there's some moments where I was just kind of like just in awe, you know, that I'm standing there. And, and, and you know, there, there's many moments where you, you feel that the culture shock, you're there. And uh, yeah, I, I would say that's that is the biggest thing alongside. Make sure you have a valid passport. I mean, I, I can't even stress that one enough. Um, Thirty seven. This is in 2021. This is according to The Economist. They did a poll. Who knows if it's accurate or not, but. 37% of Americans owned a valid passport. 37%. 37%? Yeah. That is not surprising to me. I mean, yeah, with the times, I'm not surprised if like a lot of people just let their passports expire, but Jesus. Well, tra traditionally, Americans are known to be one of the least traveled people. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it, it, it's always mind blowing to me. You know, but uh, I, a lot of people just never think, never think to leave, you know, the United States, let alone for a lot of people, their own state, you know, so getting a passport is something that uh, a lot of people haven't even thought about or considered, and they don't even actually know how to travel to another country in terms of like visa and immigration, that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I, I think you have to right out of the gate, consider one culture shock, but right under culture shock, do I have the right, uh, the right documents necessary to actually go on this journey? And you need to start getting it as soon as possible because it can take a, a pretty long time to get it. Yeah. As, as with everything with dealing with the government, it takes a while <laughs> to, to yeah. get that paperwork through. And especially right now, a friend exactly. of mine works for the um, the passport agency in the US. And the backlog there is probably, if you pay for expedited, you're not really getting an expedited rate because everybody picks expedited. So the expedited becomes the norm. Ah, uh, If everybody's picking expedited, then no one's picking expedited. Okay, right. So you're looking at possibly, because right now, from what I understand, how the and this is way into the logistics of passport agencies, but they basically, you mail, you have to mail your passport in. You can't walk into a passport agency. You have to mail it in. And it all goes to a sorting center unless you live in certain, like I think in Texas and a couple other states. Um, they have one central sorting center in Philadelphia. And then they go there, they sort through the passports, process the applications partially. Say, okay, this needs to go back to New Orleans. So I'll mail it from New Orleans. It'll go to Philadelphia, sit there for five to seven weeks until it's sorted, then get back here. And then it's on a stack of things to be processed. So you you got to, you know, it, it's a very long process. And so right now they're saying it could take anywhere from 12 to 18 weeks to get a passport. Obviously, it's there are now. some like emergent situations, but it's and, and 12 is very, very um, optimistic. And not realistic. Let's just say it's an ideal situation if you get it in 12 weeks. So Very if, good to know. if you are looking to travel within the next year mm -hmm. and you don't have a passport, apply now. <laughs> apply yeah, now. Even if you, you 
think you there's like a one percent chance go ahead and apply yeah. for the passport my passport expires next year in may and i have the application filled out to mail it out i'm gonna do it i was actually meant to do it before the hurricane but i didn't so it's been sitting on my desk to mail out and i'm doing it now because i want to make sure it's back by march of next year because it, it could take six you don't know um, and you know, another, another important thing about the passports, which your situation just reminded me is even if you do have a passport, if your passport is going to expire shortly after, you know, your, your travel time or, or anywhere close to the time you're aiming to travel, yep. that can be a problem too. So you need to get it renewed. So you know, your passport actually is valid well past the dates of your trip because you, you could run into a problem with the country allowing you to enter if your passport expires, let's say, I don't know, a month after you get there. You know? Yep, that is true. And, you know, I deal with all of this all the time. Uh, a lot of the times the students that come on the study abroad program that I work for, um, you know, it's their first time traveling. So I'm actually getting students that never owned a passport mm, in their yeah. life. Um, so it's really exciting mm. to work with those students, uh, because it's just, it's an exciting time. They're getting their fast passport for the first time and they're super excited to go to Japan. And like Nigel said, um, if you are a first time traveler, um, in general, not just Japan, you know, this, the thing to do before going is do your research, do your independent research, you know, get prepared as prepared as you can be. Um, don't just go there and kind of willy nilly it. Um, you know, it might, you might have a very different experience than what a lot of people have been talking about. Um, and you know, not only is it going to help you like reduce culture shock, but it'll also give you like appreciation for the country that you're going to go visit. Um, and it'll help you really, really get involved in the lifestyle of the place that you'll be visiting. Um, so definitely do your research before going over there. That cannot be stated enough. I will say I second that. Oh, yeah, yes. definitely. But sadly, what is the top thing that ruins people from not studying abroad. I hear it from all students and it drives me nuts at some point because it's so sad to see them give up all their goals, hopes, and dreams of studying abroad because of this. And that's financials. Dollar dollar bills, y'all. Or yen, yen, yen. <laughs> bills, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finances just aren't there. They, they tell me I can't afford it. And, you know, I sympathize with that. I understand every student is on a different kind of budget. You know, some students are more fortunate than others. You know, I was fortunate enough to have parents that tried their best to bring me over there. And, you know, they did. And it was great. Um, but for students who may not be as fortunate, um, you know, there are scholarship and award opportunities out there that you can apply for that will count towards your study abroad program. So um, I know, Doug, you were talking about you actually got a s scholarship to study abroad. Yeah, yeah. So the, the one of the big ones, at least, and I think it's still one of the big ones nowadays, uh, is the Freeman Asia Scholarship. Um, I it, there, There's different ways. I mean, if, you, if you're going for a summer session, a s semester, or a full academic year, there are scholarships for each level. So, um, and the dollar amounts obviously change based on how long you're going to be there for, but they do pay out based on like the duration of your trip. And, um, you know, there's some other requirements on there. Um, but it's, uh, I, I applied for it and I was fortunate enough to get it. And it definitely helped because it would help cover my dormitory costs. Cause when I was living here, I didn't have that. That was an expense I didn't have. Um, you know, so that was a new expense. And fortunately, that that scholarship helped cover that cost. Um, you know, then there's other ones out there, too. Um, I know them all. <laughs> yeah, I, I should just let you ramble them off. I, I did some research, but, you know, I think there's like a bridging bridging scholarship. I don't know if that one's still around. No. Um, I think it was. No, it's not no. anymore. OK, but since you only got the Freeman one, um, Nigel, I know that you got a um an award from the university yeah so what 
students need to realize is that your university that you go to might have awards and scholarships available that you can use for study abroad. And, and if you're on federal financial aid, that federal financial aid may cover some of your costs for study abroad. Yeah. Nigel, which ones did you do? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the major ones that I was like really targeting and hoping that I would get, and I did get was through the the actual like international center, international department at UNO. Yeah. And they had an award. It was a scholarship for um, like a, uh, I think it was called a global ambassador award. You know, it wasn't like, uh, I didn't like pay for the whole trip or anything, but it was definitely very helpful. Um, and I was super excited because it actually did like play a role in making the trip possible for me. Um, so yeah, don't, don't, um, you don't always have to, you know, go on Google and type in, you know, the scholarships, the big major ones, your university might have a scholarship for you. And the, you know, the, the pond will be a little bit smaller than, than competing with people on the national scale. So don't, don't, uh, don't discount yeah, those. Definitely. And, and I actually, a couple of the, the, it's funny how it works, um, in the interview process for that scholarship, I was in the waiting room with other students who were interviewing for the, the same scholarship and also going on the Japan program. And so it's like we all met and we're still in touch today, you know, so you, you never know, you know, it'll it'll put you in contact with people. And it's it's um, also really cool because those types of scholarships, when you start writing and trying to get them, it really puts into perspective what the trip means for you and you know why it's important to you so it's it's kind of a cool effect you know you you really start to see you know why you really want this and what it means yeah to you. yeah definitely yeah and and one other thing too you can look at is local organizations that are not necessarily associated with your school but they may some like similar interest groups like you know like 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 um like japan society not that they have it but those types of organizations sometimes have grants or scholarships that they give to aspiring students that are looking to study abroad. So just something to keep in mind. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a national scholarship organization. It doesn't have to be your school, but just look around because there are financial assistance opportunities out there that can make your trip available and make it available yeah. to you. Um, and just kind of keeping a checklist of everything you need to do and keeping yourself organized. I feel like it's such a underrated part of this process because it is a lot of paperwork. It is a lot of preparation. It can be and it can't be. You need to really read what the scholarship requires of you. It could be as simple as put an application and write a paragraph. And it could be as, as, as extensive as write a two-page essay on why you should go to Japan. I mean, it really depends on the scholarship. And I like to tell my Japan students that go to study abroad on the UNO Japan program, I always tell them, get creative with their funding. Because those my Japan students, because we have other programs at the university, but my Japan students seem to be more on the need scale for funding. Um, and I like to encourage them to get super creative. Start a GoFundMe. You would be surprised how many people will actually donate to a GoFundMe for study abroad. You would be very, very surprised. You may have a super supportive teacher that can't just hand you the money, but they'll go ahead and give you some GoFundMe money. I guarantee it. Um, I had one student that actually went to their local church and did a fundraiser. So just get creative. If you really, really want to study abroad, you will make it happen. Trust me. Money will not stop you. Um, but... On the topic of national scholarships, there are a few that I do want to point out um, just to help listeners who may want to study abroad or know someone that wants to study abroad. Um, the Gilman Scholarship is super crucial. If you are a Pell Grant recipient, um, that is a perfect scholarship for you. We've had several students get that scholarship and use it for the program. Um, it awards very nicely, so definitely consider the Gilman Scholarship. There is also Fund for Education Abroad that is another national scholarship that will um, help fund your um, study abroad program. 
there is diversity abroad, they will also have scholarships available um, to fund your study abroad experience. And um, specifically, if you're going to study language, so if, say, you found a study abroad program that is specifically just for Japanese language, it's like an intensive language program, um, try the, I think it's called Critical Language Scholarship, um, something like that, the wording. That's it. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, they can really, really help with uh, funding if you get that scholarship. Um, so those are just a few of the main ones I really wanted to point out um, for listeners. Um, so if you are interested in studying abroad and you're trying to plan it for your future or someone else's future, um, really give those schol- national scholarships a glance, um, see what they require, see what the requirements are, and really try and go for those. I like to tell my students, you know, you're thinking right now, oh, I'm not going to go get that scholarship. There's no way I'm going to get it. So I'm just not going to apply at all. Please, please do not have that mindset. There are several other students who have that exact same mindset, and then you're not going to have a pool of people trying to get this scholarship. Shoot your shot. So please, yeah, apply for as many as possible. There's no rule that says you can't apply to several scholarships. Apply to all of them and see which ones Mm -hmm. you get. There was a student who went on the Japan program who funded like 90% of her program through scholarships and awards. So definitely, definitely, definitely fill out all those scholarship applications. Um, You will not be sorry about that. And and you'll never be surprised at, or you will be surprised at how much opportunities that are out there um, to, to get, I don't want to say free money because you are working for it. You got to put some effort into this stuff. Yeah. Um, But You know, I think that effort is visible in the the work that you do to go and apply for these scholarships. And, you know, these organizations do uh, appreciate that and they award accordingly. Yeah. Now, another um, barrier that students have when it comes to study abroad is they think they need to know the language in order to go on study abroad. And that I don't know. That surprises me how they think that. Uh, You don't need to know the language. Now, of course, you can study the language while studying abroad, Um, especially some programs might, you know, have a Japanese class and you can take it willingly or maybe they'll they'll have you take it anyway. Um, And just being in that country, you will learn some kind of Japanese. Trust me. Um, It's kind of impossible not to know at least one word by the end of your study abroad program. But, um, you know, sometimes, actually most of the time, the classes are taught in English. You know, they're not just going to push you into a class that's in full Japanese. That's, that's not going to happen. Maybe in your nightmares, but not in uh, real life. Unless you're doing like an intensive, intensive Japanese program, an exchange program, it'll happen. But other than that, it won't happen that way. Um, so really don't let the language stop you from studying abroad. Um, it's really not that scary. Like Nigel said, English is everywhere. You would be surprised. Of course, any knowledge of the native language wherever you go is helpful. Absolutely. If you the more Japanese you know, the better. But you can function perfectly fine in a, in a society. Uh, I I mean I can't speak for every country in the world. The countries <laughs> that I have been to, uh, even you know outside of Japan, within Europe, um, you've, I've been able to function totally fine without you know knowing the native languages now of course i always try to study a language you know before i go and again like i said it always helps but you know don't don't let you know language be a barrier for you absolutely i agree with that yeah as as someone that studied for a couple years uh before i went on study abroad i i i thought i was going in i was like oh i I can read hiragana and some kanji and and katakana and i could you know i I was kind of like book smart like i understood like what was in the textbook really well, but we didn't do a lot of speaking and listening. And so I felt that was a barrier for me, but it wasn't something that was inhibiting my ability to enjoy the country. Cause yeah. um, you know, you're not, if you're going on, especially if you're going on a program with other students that are coming in from out, out of the country, you're all going to be going through the same experience together. So you're not going to be necessarily alone in any kind of struggles. And 
you kind of forge these bonds through through I don't want to say adversity, but a common challenge, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of a cool experience, and and you get through things. You learn from your other friends, and you learn from your mistakes. I don't know we've mentioned that a lot on our uh, language episodes. That just some of the best lessons you could learn are just screwing something up in a foreign language and then realizing it well after the fact, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely not something that should prevent anybody from traveling abroad. I know that some people don't like that sense of, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's vulnerability. Not insecurity, but vulnerability. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, just not being able to control your, what you want to express, um, to a fullest degree. Um, and it definitely does come with some, uh, you know, everyone feels that to some extent, but, um, I, I wouldn't let it, restrict you and again tokyo is especially if you're going to tokyo or a bigger city um those cities are much more um welcoming and 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 accommodating i guess english prevalent yeah like you can get around there's a lot of signs in english and they accommodate uh, like restaurants folks will you know try to speak to you in english if they if they know any um so yeah yeah, yeah and by far we're not saying you know go there and speak english you know learn learn you know as much japanese as you can you know learn oh, yeah. as much of any native language yeah. as you can of yeah. course and, and try try. Yeah. try speaking the language because you know if you speak the language they're gonna be so happy to hear you speak japanese and they're gonna want to have i mean that's the scary part once you do try and then they're like oh i want to have a full-blown conversation with you then that's scary because it's like no i'm not there yet but they're super great about it you know they're very cheerful about it they're very encouraging they want you to keep going and keep studying and it's just really unless nice you absolutely to suck see. you know then you should probably you know stick to english now, <laughs> you know but uh no i'll cut that out but <laughs> also cut this out. I was going to say, you know, yeah, you know, like in France, you know, I've, I've been to France and when you speak French and you butcher it, the, the conversation is not going to continue in French. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, there's no, like a, really? there's like a oh, noticeable, so like, oh, okay, let's switch to English, you know? And, um, I would say I didn't really, Aww. didn't really experience that much in, uh, in Japan, you know, I, I experienced the opposite where I would speak in Japanese and then they would like the person I was speaking with would try their hardest to respond to me in English, even though I was yeah, speaking in Japanese I experienced a lot. and I would respond back. In, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, it's, it's just much easier to convey this in, in Japanese than it was English. And I guess they also wanted to, the, the yeah. person I was talking to wanted to like practice their English too, English. which is you know fair enough. I get it. Some, you know? I, I always hear people um, say yeah. that, that's like uh they they get annoyed with that because they're like oh i want to practice my japanese yeah. with a person but they're speaking english but yeah exactly. but they feel yeah. the same way right. about english right. yeah yeah That's it's, not a, right. it's a bridge you know yeah. and uh it's a two-way stream so yeah no yeah. it's it's pretty cool but yeah don't let language yeah. be a barrier for you so we were starting to kind of talk about our study abroad experiences so i want to go into that um you know what were some crucial moments of y'all's study abroad experiences? What 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 would y'all like to share with our listeners? What do they need to know? Oh man, I mean, what do you want them to know? I, I could I, I I could talk about. Oh, we know, Doug. You, you could, I talk could talk forever. all day. <laughs> 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 could talk forever. I mean, it's just there's so much you can do, um, and it it really depends on where you go. Obviously, I was in Tokyo for my study abroad experience. Um, and I think my best investment while I was there, um, was getting a bicycle. I, I, in the first half of the year, um, I relied solely on public transportation. Um, you know, the, the trains, the subways, which again, that was culture shock in itself. Cause being in new Orleans, we don't have trains or subways or what the hell's a subway, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except for that, that sandwich shop down the road, right. you know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I had been primarily using, I guess kind of out of, I never used it before. So I liked using the train system and stuff. Um, but I eventually invested in a bike and that was actually the first time I had ridden a bike in probably eight or nine years. So I just remember buying the bike and then trying to ride it home. And I like literally almost fell off like eight times on <laughs> again, it's like hopping on a bike. You eventually figure it back out. But um, that really opened up things for me. 
I started exploring more. I would just hop on my bike and ride. Like if I was going to school, I started riding to school. It saved me money. Um, you know, it's like a, a, a mama chitty is what they call it. Like the like kind of like the basic bikes with like a little basket on it and stuff. Um, everyone kind of has those. And um, like it, it really opens up things. And it, like, like I said, it's an initial investment of like maybe a hundred bucks. But, you know, that saves you train fare. If you're just going like two stations over a 10 minute bike ride, you know, I mean, you probably quicker going on your bike there than it is walking to the station, getting on the train, going two stops and then walking wherever you're going. So it's cheaper and and quicker. But I feel like it opened up a lot of doors for me. The only time that it sucked was in the summer. And I literally would have to bring multiple changes of clothes uh, because I would ride in a nasty T-shirt there. I'd be covered drenched in sweat because Tokyo summer is no joke. Um, and then, um, you know, I'd have to go to the bathroom and put on deodorant and put on like a new shirt, dry off, towel off, like before going to class or before meeting up with friends and stuff. So it was kind of pain in the butt in that, w- that regard, but I liked it. I thought it, you know, let me really explore the city um, in a different way uh, than if I was just taking the trains. So that would, that'd be one of my tips. And I, I, like I said, I'm going to let you guys talk for a little bit and then I'll come back to another thing later on. No, but that's good. I'm glad you shared that. Yeah. A lot of students, I feel, you know, they're so nervous about the experience that, you know, maybe their nerves kind of get to them and they don't explore as much as they should or would like to, because then they like come back from the experience. They're like, man, you know, I wish I would have did this or man, I, I wish I would have, you know, went on that, you know, trip that all these other students went on and I decided not to go. I decided to just stay at home or stay in the city or, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, I'm glad that you were able to, you know, kind of take the initiative for yourself, Doug, and, you know, go on a bike and just go at it, go explore. That's awesome. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of challenging myself. And I mean, if you can't afford a bike, just take one of the unlocked ones on the street, right? So oh, yikes. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Not that no. I did that. I know somebody that did. And actually funny story. Oh, he, he, yikes. He did that. And then like, cause he, we were coming home from a, uh, like a, a drinking party and biking home. Uh-huh. Cause it was well after last train and he just jacked somebody's bike and it was just like abandoned, but turns out like two, a week later, he kept riding it. I don't know what the, what the hell he was thinking. He got pulled over by the, the cops in Tokyo to check his like uh, foreigner registration card. Um, and they were they ran the, the registration number on the bike and said, "Hey, this is in your bike." And then they're like, "This bike has been reported for four weeks." And he's like, "Wait, I took it like two weeks ago." And he was never so, seen again. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and he got out. It, it was that was a crazy story. Uh, yeah, another story for another day. But, um, wow. but yeah, don't do that. Um, yeah, don't get in trouble get, in Japan, please. If you're arrested. studying abroad, um, if you're studying abroad, do not get in yeah, trouble. That a, is like the worst thing that could possibly ever. Happen. And that was during study abroad. That was a buddy of mine that was during a oh study abroad God. program. And uh, I don't think he's listening to the podcast, but if he does, he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> and I'm sure oh, I'll geez. get a text once this airs. So, uh, <laughs> nice. wow. Well, if, if I could, one, if I could offer something like from my experience. I, I had done like little trips, like, you know, the, the carnival cruise stuff to like Mexico and stuff. Now, I don't really <laughs> count that as leaving the country, right? So, but it is, it counts, it counts, uh... it counts. <laughs> okay. Well, this was the first like major time that I left the country yeah. and on my own. Um, and so for me, the study abroad experience was, I always liken it to like the bursting of a bubble. And for me, that bubble was like U.S. focused and U.S. centric bubble and leaving the country and just seeing that the world was much more vast. There are many more perspectives uh, than than you than you hear here. You know, um, there's there's people who are living all different walks of life. I think for me, one of the most uh, like mind blowing parts of the trip was realizing that. And I was at the university and I, I was in, in a building at Toshisha and I saw a, a map of the world and I'm looking at the map of the world and I don't even recognize the world. I'm like, what, like, what is going on? Like, what type what, like, is this like Pangea or something? You know, it's like a really old map and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my God, this is a map of the world, but Japan is based at the center. 
And so the U.S. is like all the way on the other side. And I'm like, it, it looked so foreign to me. And at that moment, I realized, you know, it's like, wow, like, it, like metaphorically speaking, but also, you know, literally, like I was literally experiencing a new way to look at the world. And I think that is one of the things that really encompassed my entire trip. And in doing that, and, and you know, part of that, I would say that's important for everyone to an important step so you can do that too is to get out like Doug said and explore but also talk to people try to understand the people who are living there you know and and in doing that I think your life will be enriched as well because you you might find that you speak completely different languages you might find that you know you know completely different things about like history uh for example I, I remember sitting at a lunch table and talking with the student and, and they didn't know who dr martin luther king was but then they asked me did i know a like you know a, a, a figure from history a social like movement figure and i was like i have no idea who that is and they're like well, how could you not know that you know so it's you talk to people you understand so much more about yourself, where you come from, uh, but you also understand that people around the world oftentimes want the same things. People, you know, want a safe and secure future. You know, they, they, they love their families. They love food. You know, they, they love to travel. They love shows and reading books, you know, and, and I think when you travel and you see all of this in person, it just, it can really, you know, impact you. And um, I often say I went to Japan and I learned more about the U.S. than I did Japan. And for me, that was so true, you know. So I, I would I would definitely say, like Doug said, get out and explore. I would add on to that, talk to people, try to understand the people and the culture that you are living in and experiencing. And, you know, don't don't take it for granted. Don't, don't stay in your room. You know, you're, you've gone... What, it, it, I guess it depends on the time of year, what, maybe 14 hours ahead, you know, you're, you're, you're not there to just sit in a room, get out and explore and discover, you know, what is there. Man. And, and one thing you said too, like, and I, I know I've mentioned this a lot with like the jet program and stuff that you really, I, I, I have lifelong friends that I've made on that program, but my study abroad year was two years before that I even went over for jet. And that was my first, like you said, bursting a bubble. Like I never really traveled out of the country, but I had never traveled out of the country before. You know, I'd, I'd gone. Oh, you didn't take the carnival cruise? No. <laughs> um, no, no. Like that was, I mean, the furthest out of the country I've ever been was Epcot. Ooh. In, the, in the world showcase, right? Like you, you kind of walk around, you, you're kind of in these like mock worlds. But like it, it was, it was mind blowing, you know, to like just talk, like you said, talk to people and really get to learn about yourself in, in that there's a lot of shit that you don't know, you know? And then there's like so much like perspectives too. Like, I mean, I, it just changes how you look at things. Yeah. Um, and and I, it's one of the most underrated parts about studying abroad. You're going to Japan, but you're meeting people from all over the world, you know, whether it's at a bar, whether it's in class, whether it's at your dorm or wherever, you know, like you're meeting people from all over the world. And I mean, each one of those people is going to impact you in some way. Well, it may be minor, it may be major, you know, they may become a best friend of yours. So um, it's it's really cool how like study abroad can present you those opportunities. And you said you're meeting people from all over the world. I just want to say, I don't care where you go. You're going to meet somebody from Canada. I just feel like every time I go somewhere, there is the Canadians, man, Canadians travel, man, because they do. I, they in do. Japan, I've met tons that, of yeah. Canadians. Canadians were my see, first friends. You know, it's like in, uh... every country <laughs> I go to, there are people traveling from either from definitely from Canada or Australia. And it's, it's just it blows me away Australia every time. Too. <laughs> Like, do, oh, I love do Australians people in Australia and Canada, Australia like, work? Like, or do they just travel full time? I'm not sure. I still haven't figured that one out. But we'll, we'll have to put that into the to be addressed later column. But, yeah, just be on the lookout for Canadians and Australians. They'll, if you see them, they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll be your friends. They've traveled. They know things. So, so seek them out. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> 
Yeah, um, my study abroad experience, uh, what I can offer, is very unique because um, I have it from both perspectives. I have it from the student perspective and I have it from like a professional ex perspective. Um, and I always like to point that out when I'm like kind of advertising the UNO Japan program because um, I feel like it's very unique to me. Um, you know, no one else can really say that. Um, so like when I go into class presentations and, you know, I have all these students looking at me and, um, you know, I'm trying to tell them about the program. One of the first things I do point out all the time is like, you know, I'm standing up here right now talking to you about study abroad, but I was one of you before. Um, That's you know, powerful. when I, yeah, it is, it really is. And it gives me chills every time I talk about it because it's so true. You know, when I studied abroad, I was a freshman, just got to UNO, you know, I didn't know what I was doing and I found out about study abroad and I did it. I did it immediately then and there, you know, I didn't make it a goal or anything like you two, you know, oh, I always wanted to study abroad. I had no idea study abroad even existed. Uh, I, I just didn't know. But when I found the opportunity, I just wanted to go for it. And the thing was, it's sort of challenging for me to go because, you know, not only was I a freshman, I'm a first generation college student. My parents didn't go to college. So that's something else to think about. And then I was going to be, if I were to go, the first person in my family to go abroad. No one's has ever gone out the country. Wow. Yeah. So like... I'm in a family where their mindset, which I think I've quoted this before, but like literally my father told me, why would you go anywhere? Everything you need is right here. So like with that mindset, like to try to convince my parents and everyone to be supportive of my decision to go study abroad, it was extremely difficult. <laughs> you know, like not only did I have to face those barriers for myself, but you know, then I had to deal with people telling me, you know, oh, are you sure you want to study abroad? One of the things that a lot of people like to point out with me is like, I'm a picky eater, which I can be a picky eater. And back in the day, oh, I'm sure I was a very picky eater. So one of the things that they like to use against me was, oh, you're not going to be able to eat over there. You know, you're not going to be able to find food. I'm like, what are you talking about? And of course, from a stereotypical American, you know, the first thing that they think about Japan is fish. All you're going to eat is fish. And so I hate fish. <laughs> and so my everyone was telling me not to study abroad in Japan because I wouldn't be able to eat. I wouldn't be able to find anything. And you know what I said to that? I said, I don't care. Then I'll eat the goddamn fish. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to do this thing. You know, I always, not always, but, you know, ever since middle school, I liked Japan. I learned about Japan online. You know, I looked up things. It seemed like a great place. I wanted to experience it for myself. So I was very determined to do it. I really, really wanted to go study abroad. I wanted to go to Japan so bad. And I'm glad I did the study abroad experience because like I said before, it's very different than going as a tourist. As a tourist, you're kind of like in your own space. You're very kind of secluded. You're to yourself. It's not as easy to be like open with others. Whereas when you're studying abroad, you're most likely going to be with a group of people or a few people who are going to be in the exact same situation as you. So it's very easy to bond with those people and to kind of kind of have the same experience, but not exactly the same experience. Um, and then another thing that I always tell students when I, um, you know, talk about the UNO Japan program and I try to convince them, you know, this is the right thing to do for yourself if you're really interested in Japan. You know, back as a student, yes, I thought about the finances. I was like, I'm going to spend this amount of money. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? But like 10 years later, when I'm telling about all of my study abroad adventures and all of my stories to people that are probably sick and tired of my stories now. Um, We're not sick and tired of your stories. <laughs> well, y'all don't know half of them. But, <laughs> okay. um, but, you know, 
I'm not talking about the money. 10 years later, after my study abroad experience, I don't even yeah. remember how much money I spent and nor do I care. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about those funny moments when I accidentally got lost in Japan because I didn't know where I was and I had to call my roommate to try to figure out where I was. You know, it's that time when I accidentally ate takoyaki because I thought it was going to be like shredded octopus and it was like a whole freaking octopus in there. You know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about those funny, fun moments. I'm not going to be talking about, oh, you know, I spent like four thousand dollars in total and it was awful and i struggled i'm not gonna talk about that i never mention that you know i always talk about the good times i had studying abroad and the funny moments that happened and all my experiences and my learning that i did that's what i'm talking about so yeah right now money's a big deal but it's not going to be a big deal in 10 to 20 years and one one thing too um that will echo is when you're there, I, I know budget is definitely going to be important because you want to make sure you have, you know, you're not going to, especially if you're a student and you're going to be, you probably won't have a bank account or you may have a bank account. I don't know how your situation is going to be set up. I don't remember how my situation was set up. I was, since I was there for a year, I can't, I don't think I had a bank account during that time. Um, actually, no, I did. I did have a bank account. I did. I did. I did. Um, Mizuho was the name of the bank or Mitsubishi UF I don't know whatever um but I had a bank account but some if you're going for a summer you're probably not going to need a bank account you know no. so um but there are ATMs at your post offices and your convenience stores where you can take money out um where you need to uh, but just be conscious of your budget but at the same time don't let the cost of something for one even you know like that one thing maybe if it's like fifty dollars more than you want to spend don't let that prevent you from a really awesome experience too. Like some things like pick and choose your battles, obviously, um, you know, but there are some things that I had a friend of mine who he busted his computer because he got super drunk at a, a drinking party and he woke up the next morning and his computer was like saturated in water. I don't know. He doesn't know what happened. He doesn't remember. Um, and all I know is that he spent like, I think he was like a, he made it. He's like personal, like custom computer that he built. That was like $2,000 and he rebuilt that computer, which he really wanted, but then he used all of his money that he had towards everything else. So he literally didn't do anything in Japan except stay in his dorm room and bike everywhere. And then, but he would not go out to dinner. He would not go out and do so. So like he picked, the computer over the experience see that's exactly what i said not to do there you go. right right so we're a little too late with this <laughs> podcast episode i know i know so <laughs> but just the, those kind of things like pick and choose your battles and and pick and choose where the budget is a hard stop for you because um there may be some things that you may regret if you don't do it i mean i know for sure i have things that i regret that i didn't do while i was there so um that's definitely it's 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 hazy and it's it's hard to decide you know, especially if you're living on your own for the first time ever and you're having to do your own budget for the first time ever, like, and you don't have a source of income unless you're doing like under the table, like tutoring and stuff, which is an option. Uh, <laughs> you're not supposed to say that, but it's out there. Um, cat, you know, like cash tutoring and stuff. Um, but teaching English on the internet. Yeah. You know, I mean, I that, talk you there's, there's like a lot that, of options you know? nowadays that that weren't there when I studied abroad. So um, you can probably make some money while you do it. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, just, just don't let financials really stop you from a really amazing experience. Yeah, definitely. I, I love to always point that out because that always seems to be some kind of issue and I don't know, like, yeah, money's a big deal, but it won't be in the long scheme of things. Trust me. Yeah. And Jen, you, you said the stuff about fish and it made me laugh because it actually reminded me. And I think I mentioned this on one of our other episodes with um, with Matt Alt. Um, but my first experience in Japan, the day I arrived, I got off the plane, you know, was feeling pretty confident about my Japanese, walked up to the uh, Kuro Neko like delivery service counter to deliver my bags to my dorm. Um, uh -huh. And... 
couldn't understand a damn word the guy said to me and i was like oh man i thought i knew japanese <laughs> like um so you know unfortunately the guy from the university like they have like a buddy system that they they would have like yeah. volunteers come out and meet you like students uh that would mm-hmm. meet you and escort you to your dorm and kind of get you from point a to point b so um yeah. you know he helped me out with that and then we got on the train got to the do- the the station near my dormitory and then i was walking to the station I'm like man it smells like mcdonald's in here and then I walked out the stairs <laughs> right across the street to McDonald's. McDonald's. I mean, right, yep. right there. You know? Yep. So, I mean, wow. it's like, it's just, yeah, there's that misconception that, like you said, everything's fish or rice or whatever. But yeah. no, man, and like, it's not. I proved, I proved them all wrong because when I started posting pictures on Facebook, like it was nothing but like teriyaki burgers and <laughs> just a bunch of like non fish related food. And I was like, haha, suckers, yeah. see, I'm surviving. So, you know, when I was there, um, I had a, a Japanese student at the university I was studying at, and uh, we, were, we were out exploring the town one day, and he points to McDonald's and he says, Hey, look, it's the American embassy. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, so, you don't want to be that person. <laughs> That's yeah, that's going that's to McDonald's. I, I never forgot that. I was like, yeah, wow. No, I, I, Japanese I, McDonald's I, is so good. I say I say at least try Japanese McDonald's once because it, it is tastes way better very, than American McDonald's. But it try does. it, but then go to Moss Burger. Oh yes, Moss Burger for the win. Oh overrated. Doug, shut up. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's overrated. You're overrated. <laughs> yeah, you're ridiculous. Moss Burger is amazing. You, and. We would do like the ten cheeseburger ten. Me and my Canadian buddy, see, we do the ten cheeseburger challenge. Oh, We'd God. both buy ten cheeseburgers and see who can eat them the fastest. That was that college budget, right? Because it's like mm. ten bucks. That was like our meal for the day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I you know one one one, one more question before we kind of wrap on on things is we haven't really talked about like like stay like where we stayed and how how what living was like. Um, you know, for the UNO Japan program, do you have a dormitory on campus or what was, what was your situation? Did they do homestay? Like how, how did you, so, um, before Nigel, before Nigel answers, because, you know, him and I had the exact same experience, but Nigel, I just want to let you know the experience is about to change. I thought it already did. Oh, it's about, to, it, it did, but we never got to utilize it because of COVID. Oh, okay. uh, Breaking but news. It's still about to change even more. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So Nigel is right. You know, we did have a dorm style kind of uh, living situation um, from the university. Um, now, what the it looks like, which it's very experimental. We don't know what it's going to be like because it'll be the first time of trying it. Um, we're going to have two options, act- actually. Uh, one is going to be another dorm style. Um, but the living situation, Nigel, for those dorms is actually very different now. Um, Doshisha has a more minimalistic idea about the dorms. So, uh, the rooms are very minimalistic, uh, style, and then they are encouraging a lot of cross, um, intermingling. So like the hallways are accessed by everyone um it's it's going to be very communal living um that's so actually kind of cool though very know? interesting I, I mean very, i thought you were going to be like capsule hotels or something you know but no 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 no, no. <laughs> no. well yeah no that's that's pretty cool um hey I, I'd, yeah. I'd be looking forward to seeing how that turns out yeah i'm excited for it too um i'm trying to get more details from them uh because i need those details very soon but yeah um and then of course the second option that we have which we were gonna utilize these past two summers but haven't gotten to yet um which is we booked a guest house um and so it's kind of like an apartment style um but more laid back and more like organized um So we have those two options for housing. Um, And, you know, obviously for students who really want a more like, I need to be attached to someone and I'm I'm terrified, you know, then maybe the dorms are best. Um, Whereas the guest house, it's kind of away from the university. Um, It's kind of not far, but it's far enough. Um, You know, it's more for students who want to get that independent style maybe and who really want to explore on their own. Um, so I'm really excited to give those two options as, um, living space, you know, should be fun. 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. I remember the dorm that I stayed at. I think there was three, well, four options. You could do homestay. Um, they had apartments that if you want, like the kind of independent living style. Um, and then you had a study abroad dorm, like which is basically all study abroad students, or you had a Japanese dorm, which basically um, not affiliated with the school at all. But it was um, it's called Wakejuku in in the heart of Tokyo. Um, and there were four buildings. They have the north, south, east, and west dorms. And uh, basically, you know that it's just where maybe kids from all over the country come to Tokyo to go to school. Um, it's actually right near Wasira. Um, so you know they would come from all over the country. They would get one of these dorm rooms, and it's very similar in, in terms of communal. A living space you had a um you had your room that was very minimalistic it was probably my whole room was probably the size of my my wife's closet you know like it was uh you know it had a desk and a bed you know you could fill it up but it wasn't a lot of space um and then that was it in the room and then you had a communal bathroom with three squatter toilets and one western toilet so you had to be nice. lucky or patient um, <laughs> if you need to. <laughs> um, and then they had like a communal like cooking and, and dishwashing space where if you wanted to cook you could do that in there on each floor because it was like a four-story building um, and hallways and I mean each person kind of had their own decoration on the doors outside the rooms you would leave your shoes outside your dorm room um, you know so you would know if someone's having a party because there's just like 80,000 pairs of shoes how they fit <laughs> on that room I have no idea but um but yeah it was it was really cool and then they had a like a a luncheon room where it basically was like a cafeteria and you had meal tickets that was part of your your dorm fee um and you would just go kind of turn in they give you three a day one for lunch one for breakfast one for dinner um you just go in the morning you give me your ticket and you grab whatever you want for breakfast and lunch or dinner and then they had a communal shower area which is ba very much like your sento like your your little stool like on the ground with the shower head you shower off and then you had ofuro you didn't have private shower so that was my first time being naked around other people <laughs> like i didn't have any other option like it was like dang it was like getting off the plane and i'm like all right where's the shower and they're nice. like oh it's over here and i'm following this other foreign guy um that was like yeah follow me and then he had like a little bucket and a towel that he lent me and then uh, basically you you buy your own shampoo, you have your own little like bucket for shower. And then it was crazy because I, I was so petrified to get naked, you know, like because I had never done it in front, like gotten naked in front of other people like that, you know, in a communal setting. So I was all like, oh, my God, oh my God never, people, no one cares. No one absolutely cares. So after I got over that hump, you know, it was just one of those things where that was culture shock for me, like, like super, you know, self-conscious culture shock. Um, so, but that was, I, again, I, I, I love that dorm. It was so cool. Cause they had, they did have like a little like lounge area where you can kind of get together and congregate with like other people from the dorm and watch TV, um, grab some beers or whatever, you know, hang out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think the dorm life was like, I'm so glad I picked that option over the other ones. Um, you know, homestay sounds cool, but you know, I, I kind of enjoyed the independence cause it was the first time living on my own. Yeah, so. so that was a good question to pose, yeah. Doug. Yeah, great. Hey, look at me. <laughs> look at me bringing something good to the, the, the party over here. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks, guys, for sharing your uh, study abroad experience with our listeners. Um, I'm sh I hope they appreciate it, and I hope for those who, you know, didn't realize, you know, study abroad was available, you know, hopefully now you can... Like Doug and Nigel said, set those goals. Don't be like me and just find out about it one day and hurry up and rush to do it. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, anything else y'all want to add before we close out? Um, yeah, I mean, I know there's like a lot of technical information in this episode. Um, and, you know, it's a big decision. So it does involve a lot of, you know, planning. But, you know, in the end of the day, you know, just do it. Just do it. It is a life changing experience. No, but it really is. It changes your life. Like I tell students this all the time, literally, like I did study abroad back in 2010. Now I'm here working the exact same program that I studied abroad with. Obviously, the experience back in 2010 had a say in what I'm doing now. <laughs> 
So it definitely does change your life. Yeah, no, I mean, I just echo those points. It, it really does. Like, I, I don't know where I would be right now if I hadn't, you know, it, it really changed the trajectory of things for me. Um, just in terms of interest and just opening my eyes to different cultures, different beliefs, uh, different, you know, people of all walks of life. It's It's one of those things that if you have the opportunity, I tell people this too. I'm like, if you have the opportunity to go somewhere and do this type of thing, do it while you're young, do it while you yep. can do it yep. while you can get scholarships that'll pay for you to go as opposed yep. to paying for it out of pocket all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's something that, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there and I don't want to say a lot, but I'm sure there are people out there that have had bad experiences during study abroad or just traveling abroad. It happens. I mean, we can't, we'd be lying to say it doesn't. But yeah. the overwhelming number of people that have had good experiences, I, I would say far outweighs the bad. So, I mean, if you got the chance, go let, you know, if you have questions about stuff, you got Jen over here who's a, who can be your unofficial <laughs> uh, study abroad counselor. Uh, we yeah, all can be. definitely. I could. Yeah. I uh, could. But, uh, yeah. I mean, just, just, just do it. Absolutely. Like Nike, man. Yeah. Just, just do it. Just, just do it and have fun. <laughs> yeah. And if you need help, message us, email us, and we'll be happy to assist you in Indeed. trying to figure out, you know, what works best for you. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Crew of Japan podcast. In today's episode, we talked about the wonderful opportunity that is studying abroad. Not many people consider studying abroad, but it's one of the best ways to travel Japan. Will you now be considering studying abroad in Japan? Or maybe you know someone who would like to study abroad in Japan. We hope we were able to convey the importance of studying abroad. Have you studied abroad in Japan before? What was it like? We'd love to hear about your experience. Let us know on our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Crew of Japan. That's K R E W E O F J A P A N podcast. While you're there, give us a follow and some episode suggestions. That's it for today. Until next time. <laughs>